Om Namo Narayana 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 I bow to the Lord Narayana in all forms and in yours. You probably know the story, let me repeat it, that when Ramanuja, the great saint, was initiated into this mantra, his guru said two things. He said, one, this will, re- this will free anybody who utters it, and two, don't tell this to anyone. And the, Ramanuja asked him, are you sure it will free everybody who repeats it? Yes, everyone. So, in spite of his guru's uh, admonition not to give it to anybody, he stood on the top of a temple and called, everybody, everybody, come, come. And he had a crowd of people all chanting, Om Namo, Om Namo Narayana, Om Namo Narayana. This is the greeting with which sannyasis traditionally greet one another. I bow to Narayana in your form. I bow to him in your form. But, of course, as I said last time, just chanting a mantra isn't enough. There's got to be that consciousness in it. And why do the gurus teach you not to tell? Mind you, Ramanuja was a great master. He could do what he wanted. But why is this enjoyment of secrecy usual? Well, it's because when you receive diksha, when you receive initiation, you receive also a certain power. And with that power... You have to, like a germ, like a seed, you have to germinate it. You have to let it germinate by feeding it regularly with water and uh, putting it out where the sun can strike the soil and gradually it will grow up and become a little seedling and then a sapling. And then finally, when it's a tree, then it's strong enough to be able to have the deers, a deer come and rub their antlers against its trunk and it doesn't get eaten or, or uh, damaged by them. But in the beginning... You need to keep these things to yourself. That's the only reason in the autobiography of a yogi where Yogananda uh, says that only those who are qualified Kriyabans, mind you, there's been a change in addition since his passing. Originally he said only quali- only Kriyabans should give this. Now it says only uh, those who have been authorized as ministers of his organization. This is the kind of sectarianism that comes into all religions, and it's unfortunate, but it's the way of Maya, and it always happens. It is not what he said. He said, all who, um, if you want it, first of all, he said, give it to all who humbly ask for help, not those who sign the dotted line that they're members. And secondly, he said, only those who have had, who are Kriyabans can give it. But the enjoyment with that is always one of secrecy. And I've been asked this question here in India uh, by magazines and so on. Well, why, is, why does Kriya have to be secret? It isn't to keep Kriya inviolate from other people. It's to help people. When uh, a guru gives you a mantra, okay, Ramanujo is an extraordinary example because he already had that, really. He was an incarnated master. But as a rule, if you go spouting off what you have as your own deep practice, you will... You will Spread it abroad and you won't have any power behind it. That is why spiritual practices should be kept secret. Not to harm other people, but to benefit and strengthen your own self. Often in India, a husband and wife will have the same guru and not even know it. This is not necessarily usual, but it is. it does happen. The thing is that your spiritual practices are not things to be spouted. Well, let me read to you from... Autobiography of a Yogi, a short little conversation from Conversations with Yogananda. 
Saints often adopt extreme measures in their search for God, virtually starving themselves, for example, or going for long periods without sleep, or deliberately creating discomfort for their bodies. Many devotees wonder if it wouldn't help them to adopt similar practices. Even if they are following the more moderate path of meditation and Kriya Yoga, with such aspirations, aspirants in mind, the master, who himself had undergone severe austerities during his youth, counseled people generally, and I quote, It is best not to be fanatical in your search for God. Only those with some measure of realization can safely afford to risk their health and physical well-being in seeking him. Without realization, such practices make one fanatical. One time, Henry, who had been reading the life of St. Francis and was comparing the austerities of that great saint with the more moderate lifestyle the Master provided for us, asked him whether it wouldn't be a good thing for us to be more austere. The Master, an the master answered him, When God gives more, take it. He knows what is right for you. Indeed, I've experienced that because, perhaps because the present age is less heavily burdened with physical deprivations than the days of St. Francis, even our, te our tests, however intense, tend to be more psychological in nature. The, the physical flagellation of many Christian saints, the going without clothes even, or starving themselves to death. These things are okay as sort of controlling the body, and the, you're, you, you want to get control over the body, but it's better for you to seek to transcend the body, which is really what control of the body is all about. You, I've seen a hatha yogis who are expert at hatha yoga, but they hadn't, found, they hadn't created any bhav in themselves. It was all a physical thing. And so in this day and age, I have uh, seen many people have been tested, not so much physically, this path certainly is for some people, but on many paths I've seen that the tests come, but they are not, as I said, so physical as mental and spiritual. And believe me, those tests can be very sincere, very serious. It can be very uh, much of a strain to find everybody turning against you, everybody talking against you, telling untruths about you. Um, internet is a marvelous way of spreading this kind of test because everybody gets to read how horrible you are, even if you aren't horrible. They just assume it because somebody's saying it. This is human nature. And yes, these are tests until you reach the point where it just doesn't matter. I mean, what people say, whether they think you're great or whether they think you're not so good, or whether they think you're horrible, it doesn't matter. You know, one blessing I have always had is that I have never been nervous before a crowd. Even when Master had me lecturing at the age of 22, it was in his place. He was supposed to lecture, and then suddenly I appeared. The reason I wasn't nervous that I was thinking of those poor people. They've been waiting two months to hear him, and they think that they're going to hear him because he was announced, and then Suddenly this little tadpole gets up on the... I thought, those poor people, I didn't have time to be sorry for myself. But the truth is that I don't think I've ever been nervous. In fact, I know I haven't been nervous. Just one time when I had to lecture to grown-ups and children in the same talk and to think, how can I combine a teaching that will reach both and have both of them understand me, that was such a challenge that I wasn't quite sure. That was the only degree of nervousness I've ever felt. But basically, I think that, well, people are wrong about just about everything, so why should they be suddenly right if they like me, and why should they be suddenly uh, right or wrong if they don't like me? It doesn't matter. Truth is truth, and that's all I'm interested in. And the thing is, then, that as you learn to live for God, you will find yourself tested, and that test will begin, usually, with your family, Divine Mother helped me in this because, after all, a week before I met my guru and read his autobiography and then went right away to Los Angeles, I'd never heard words like guru and karma and so on as I've said before. 
Well, Divine Mother helped me by getting my parents off to Egypt, where they couldn't cut and sort of try to stop me from going. And if they'd been in America at the time, I don't know, maybe they, she knows better than I, uh, but I, I have to say that it's possible they would have talked me out of it because it was, seemed like such a harebrained thing. One day you are doing one thing and the other day suddenly you're becoming a yogi and a disciple of the great master that you've never heard of the word masters or gurus. It was very, very sudden, very emotional. And usually when you make an emotional change in your life, then the next week it's a bit different. But that commitment has been mine now for 56 years. I have never doubted for a moment this was my path and this was my guru. I knew it was a recognition that my parents wouldn't have known and they would have made it difficult for me. Thank God they weren't there then, should that have been the case, because I hadn't even met him yet. At any rate, usually people's first test is their parents, their, their family, trying to pull them down, trying to say, oh, what are you doing? Can't you serve God in the family? Why do you have to go and do something so strange? You know, everything that you do seems the norm, and everything other people do seems strange. So you get into an ashram, and you live with people who are living a spiritual life, and you begin to see that that's what seems normal. The people around you seem normal, and the others seem like uh, strange fellows. I had a very difficult time writing a book of mine. It was first called Crises in Modern Thought. Now it's called Out of the Labyrinth, but it was dealing with the modern philosophy of life, of meaninglessness, that everything is just accidental, uh, there's no meaning, there's no God, it's all just a, a happenstance. And uh, I had been living with the Vedanta philosophy and the teachings of my guru, and I knew that this was just nonsense. And I wanted to write a book to show that it was not valid. But you know, it wasn't easy because I had to go into the camp of the enemy and learn their philosophy, work with the facts they were working with if I was going to be able to answer them on their terms. I could easily answer them on my terms. You're a bunch of stupid fools. That wouldn't have done them any good. I could have said, this is nonsense. That wouldn't have helped them. It would have had a few people in my camp nodding their heads and smiling, but that's not enough. I wanted to try to convert the people who were really skeptics, atheists, that kind of people who had been fed all this kind of philosophy and believed it. So the only way I could do it was to go into that camp. It seemed like a very different world, a very foreign world. But you know, we live in so many different worlds. And when you travel as much as I have, you see that there are different worlds everywhere. And yet, everybody basically is the same. You could go to a planet that, where everything is paradise. Everything is beautiful. The thing, as I said before, the only thing wrong with it would be, hmm, what? That you would be there. You are the cause of all your troubles, and you'd take those troubles with you until you've gotten rid of your ego, or at least reached the, at least reached the point where your ego is sattvic enough to think of other people and not thinking of, of mine, all mine, oh, this is beautiful, I'm enjoying it. I remember one time climbing Mount, Washing, Mount Waterman with a friend of mine in, lower, in Southern California, and it was a really one of those magical moments that you experience in life sometimes. The sun was setting in the west, and it was casting a golden glow in a sort of a mist in the valleys, I suppose, probably the famous Los Angeles smog. And looking toward the east, the full moon was rising, and there was this beautiful blue haze in the valleys behind us. And there was just this hush over nature, so beautiful that it, you could almost feel it, except my friend said, if only I could feel it like this with my hands. And that was the trouble. You still, even in that beauty, you still think about the ants crawling over your knees and you're uh, getting hungry for dinner and you're feeling a little uncomfortable because the pine cones are too hard. And there's always something to keep you moving. I remember one time at the Lake Shrine in Pacific Palisades when uh, somebody gave this beautiful property to my guru, and uh, we were helping to get it set up. 
And there were these little nuts that kept coming into your eyes and ears and nose and sort of ruining your ability to really enjoy it. And I turned to Master. I said, look, here God has given us such a beautiful place. Why does he have to spoil it for us with these nuts? And he smiled. He said, that is God's way of keeping you always moving toward him. You see, there's always something. There's always some reason to realize that you're not, you haven't made it yet. You've just gotten up a little rise. You know how when you climb a mountain, you go up, and you have to go down into a valley, and you go a little bit higher, and then down, and so on. So life will keep taking you up and down. It'll have to take you through tests, even though you're well dedicated to the spiritual path. Those are the things you need to worry about. Physical austerities don't mean that much. I tried them for a while. I can't say I was very great at it. I, I took more and more cold showers until finally I took my entire shower in the cold. It was in January when there's snow on the ground, and uh, I was cold for weeks afterwards. It took me that long to overcome this inward shivering. But that's not the way to get there anyway, because even if I had reached the point where I was tough and nothing bothered me, would that make me pure in heart? That's what it's really all about. You must become pure in heart by giving all your desires to God. You must become pure in heart by no matter how people treat you, if they treat you well, if they treat you badly. And when they do treat you well, watch out. <laughs> There's something around the next corner. Life will go on treating you up and down, shaking you like a rag doll. But the final understanding is that he is everything. I was going to, in a car years ago. I had an appointment to keep. And the rain was so so heavy, I could hardly see ahead of me in the road. I suddenly thought, well, if I can't have good weather outside, I'll create good weather inside. And this song came to me, Joy in the Heavens. And I actually wrote it while I was driving. We'll sing it to you now. Joy to you. Your soul is as free as the air. 